Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here in this beautiful campus and also to be in a conference uh, devoted to longitudinal studies, which is something that we're very, very interested in. So I'm going to spend uh, my time here to mainly talk about unpublished stuff related to the S3VP uh, program, the, the Scopy Sidelight Lab Wellness Profiling. Um, but just to give you a, a, just a little bit of background where I am, uh, in Stockholm at the Karolinska Institute we have a new national infrastructure for next generation life science. Uh, we're sort of devoted to this of the global trends that there is a need for major infrastructure, technology is evolving rapidly and there's a lot of big data being produced and the government has given us almost 5 million euros uh, per year to, to start this institute uh, and I was the founding director for the first five years. Um, we went from zero people to 1,200 in five years, so this was quite uh, an, um, amazing. Uh, and right now then, this is an infrastructure to do omics kind of studies for the researchers in Sweden, but also abroad. Um, one of the nice things about this is that we had a lot of funding for infrastructure, so we now have very good facilities for cryem for whole genome sequencing and single cell genomics and, and so on. Um, part of this and uh, w sort of the focus during the first years was very much to do sequencing and these are just some pretty pictures of some uh, animals and, and uh, trees and other things that we sequenced at Silaf Lab. But I would also say that most of the work now is to do sequencing of patients and, and, and uh, humans basically. And there is now set up routine uh, whole genome sequencing of especially babies that are born premature. Uh, one of the focus in the group has been to not only look at the DNA and the genomics but also at proteins. Uh, as you know, the proteins are the building blocks of life and therefore very interesting also as biomarkers. Uh, and we were very fortunate to get a very nice funding, actually almost 200 million dollars, uh, from a, 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 a philanthropy, from a private foundation, the Wallenberg family. Uh, and they gave us actually now uh, funding for 20 years. So that's the sort of funding that you want uh, for the, the young people in the audience. I try to get a 20 year funding, that's fantastic. Um, so they've been very supportive, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, it's interesting to see uh, what the, the philanthropy now going into mapping the building blocks of humans. Uh, we have the Wallenberg Foundation that sponsored our effort that I will come to. Uh, but as you might know, there's also a massive amount of money coming in from the Microsoft founder, Paul Allen, uh, for the uh, Institute in Seattle. And then uh, lately then, Mark Zuckerberg and the people at Facebook has put a lot of money, $3 billion, into, for example, the Biohub in, in San Francisco. At the same time, we have IT companies like Google and IBM that are sort of moving, as you might know, into the direction of personalized medicine. And lately then, there has been a very big effort now started called the Human Cell Atlas with funding from different sources. Um, so what is interesting about this is that a lot of these fundings come from philanthropy and they come sort of from the IT sector. And one of the reasons I think that this is interesting for the people coming from IT is that a lot of the problems here is maybe not anymore to create or generate the data, but to get knowledge out of the data and then move that knowledge into clinical applications. And maybe it's a very arrogant to quote yourself, uh, but uh, when it comes to big data, it's easier to generate the data than to get knowledge out of it. And I really think that's true, although I hope to convince you that we are getting quite a lot of knowledge by analyzing the big data. So um, what I thought I would do then is to divide this talk into uh, four different parts. 
uh, first give you a feeling for, uh, or a, a sort of an update on the human protein atlas and what we're doing there. Say a little bit about validation of antibodies because this is very important for us that we, uh, the antibodies are actually targeting the protein that we're aiming for. But then I will spend most of the time on unpublished stuff on the, uh, on the, uh, on the wellness pro pro profiling program, which is really a longitudinal profiling, so it fits with the conference. And then, uh, if I have time, I will say a little bit about the human secretome project that we are just launching right now. And also, I think, re relative, uh, is relevant for some of the people in this audience. So, first of all, the Human Protein Atlas. Uh, we started uh, 15 years ago. Uh, basically, the idea is to map all the human proteins. Um, we have spent about 1,500 person years on the project. Uh, main focus in Sweden, but we also use three sites in Asia. Uh, it is uh, then uh, funded, as I said, by the Wallenberg family. What we're trying to ask is very central questions in, in, pro in, 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 in proteomics. How many proteins are expressed in a given cell? How many proteins are tissue specific? It's an organ built up essentially by tissue specific proteins. What are the building blocks? Uh, but then also, last but not least, what are the targets for future uh, drugs and, and diagnostics? And I think we come very far on answering many of these questions. Uh, the program is a very multidisciplinary, uh, so it involves both engineers and bioinformatics and clinical people, um, and also a lot of visualization and data handling and so on. And I'm not going to spend so much time with technology, I will be around, so if you're interested in specific parts of the technology, you can sort of come up to me during the meeting. Uh, but the idea here is to, to make antibodies uh, and then use them to actually try to understand what the, the corresponding proteins are, are, are doing and where they are, and then put all that information in an open access database that we call the Human Protein Atlas. Uh, the sort of first um, flagship paper from the program came about three years ago in science. Uh, this was the tissue atlas. And basically what we try to do then is to use single cell resolution immunohistochemistry chemistry to actually see where are the proteins in the different parts of the human body in the context of neighboring cells um, and to provide biological and functional context. Um, so basically, what we're trying to say is that if, if a protein is expressed in the kidney, for example, if it's also expressed in the tubuli or the glomerulus or, or whatever, so you're creating all of these images that will then tell you where the protein are. Uh, we produced a lot of images. Uh, right now, we have in the database uh, close to 14 million images. Uh, and what we try to do then is to put all of this so you can actually yourself look at all of these images uh, for each protein then. And they are actually some of them beautiful. I mean, I didn't know that uh, the gut looks as beautiful as to the right there, but it does. Um, we have also been very fortunate that since we started this program, um, which was very much antibody based and uh, uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry based and confocal microscopy based, then of course the new transcriptomics methods came along, the RNA-seq. Uh, and that meant that we could then focus a lot also to look at the protein-coded transcripts in the human body. So we are then also doing that and comparing then the expression on the RNA level and the protein level and this has been very, very fruitful for us. So if you go to your favorite protein on the protein atlas, uh, in this case it's a SATB2, which is a, is a, is a gut protein, uh, what you can then see is a summary of the RNA expression to the left here, and then the protein expression to the right, and you can compare them, and then you can go in and look at the details of, of, uh, of the summary. So for the 
for the protein summary then we can then show where are they expressed in the different parts of the human body and then on the transcript level we have data from our own group also from the, the broad institute GTEx, but also from japan the Riken phantom 5 and it's amazing how often these uh, different uh, data sets overlap and 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 actually complement each other very nicely so in the science article and at the, web, at the website then you can click into your favorite organ and then see what are the proteins which are overexpressed or, or, or specific for the lung or the brain and so on and then you can actually go and, 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 and probe where they are. We also have uh, done a lot of definition of subproteomes such as the housekeeping proteins, the regulatory proteins, the secretome pro proteins, the cancer proteome and so on. So if you want to go in, you can also probe these. Um, one of the things that is very interesting for many people is that we can then also classify all the proteins where, uh, where if they are tissue specific or if they are housekeeping, and one of the surprises for us is that almost half of the proteins that we find, uh, about 10,000, are either expressed in all tissues that we look at or in most of them. Uh, and it kind of shows that the minimal cell needs a lot of proteins to actually function. Uh, and there are not that many proteins which are restricted to just one or two tissues. The other... Um, uh, the second sort of um, flagship paper came almost exactly one year ago, also published in Science. And here we're going into the smallest unit, the cell, and we are uh, looking at where are the proteins inside the cell which are in the mitochondria, which are in the lysosome and so on. And this was led by Emma Lundberg. Uh, and again, using subcellular uh, sub confocal microscopy, we can get very good subcellular resolution. So where are the cells uh, localized? And we do this in human cell lines then. Um, so um, again, the cell atlas or the subcellular atlas is again an open access database and it has hundreds of thousands of images and some knowledge based uh, uh, chapters. Um, so um, the third part of the atlas then came about six months ago, also published in Science and that is a pathology atlas. Here we did a little bit different. In this case, this was based on the American effort, the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas. We downloaded about 2.5 petabyte of data from, from TCGA, rerun them through our own pipeline, uh, used a supercomputer center for almost three months, uh, and then actually asked the question, what are the genes that are influencing the survival of the patients? Uh, and this was then published about, uh, well, uh, eight months ago. So again, this was based a lot on RNA sequencing um, and also that, that we could actually then do survival analysis and actually produced almost 100 million coupling Meyer plots, which is kind of amazing. Um, so, um, so I'm kind of happy that's a computer that takes care of it. Um, so uh, one of the surprises for us is that a large fraction of the protein coded genes have impact on the average cancer patient survival. Uh, about half of the genes are prognostic for at least one of the cancers. But actually, and unfortunately, very few of them, they are all giving rather good uh, Kaplan-Meier kind of plots. But when you look at the individual patients, it's not as convincing. And uh, I, I, I can talk a lot about this, but I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. One of the things that was very interesting for us is to look at, and make uh, personalized genome scale models. So basically, you're looking at the cancers, you see what genes are turned on, you put them into uh, metabolic models, and then you start to predict what are the metabolites uh, uh, that are needed for these cancers to, to grow. 
Uh, and it turned out then that we can find some uh, enzymatic pathways that are needed for, for survival, at least we can predict that. And in some of these cases, these were enzymes that are not needed for, 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 uh, the, uh, for, for the normal cells. So they would then be good targets for future drugs for these patients. But one of the important things here is that, that you then have to then do this kind of analysis of the tumor in order to identify these patients. So the summary of the pathology atlas, it's an open access database. It has the underlying, it's more than 2.5 petabyte. Uh, and again, it shows the importance of sharing data here so we could download, but we can also then take this data and put it out in the public domain. So uh, to just finish off this part, uh, the Protein Atlas today then, after these two articles in Science last year, has now three different parts. Uh, a tissue atlas showing where are the proteins in the human body, a cell atlas where are they inside the cell, and the pathology atlas what genes and proteins are important for clinical outcome. Um, it's very nice being here at the campus and we just have Elixir uh, headquarters just a few meters from here is that last summer then uh, LXC then decided what were the resources of fundamental importance for the wider life science community and the human protein atlas was selected as one of those so this is my self-boosting slide. Um, so uh, but also that this is very nice for us is that the Wallenberg family has said that we can put all of this data out in the public domain open access without any restrictions. And then of course, it's very nice if, if um, other people are using the data. And for sure now, we, we are very pleased that we have more than 200, actually as close to 250,000 visitors per month. Uh, and these are both from academia and industry. And if you look at the geographical spread, I don't know if you can see very well here, but here up to the right then is the visitors, the number of visitors from every city in the world. And it's kind of interesting to see how concentrated the, um, the visitors, at least to the Protein Atlas, come from the United States, Europe and the Southeast Asia. Um, you can also see the dominance of the United States when you actually look at the numbers to, to the left here. Uh, so by far most visit visitors are of the United States, but interestingly now the second country visiting the Atlas is from China, which sort of shows that a lot of things are happening there. So with that, I just want to say a few words about validation of antibodies. Um, the important thing here is that we are using antibodies to probe and see where proteins are and, and so on. We have several millions, actually more than three million antibodies to human proteins, if you go into a portal like Antibodypedia. Um, but as you know, there is a need for antibody validation because a lot of these antibodies actually don't uh, show cross-reactivity. And we also showed that in a paper some years ago that many of the commercial antibodies fail validation. So a few years ago, uh, we founded a, a, an international working group for antibody validation with a lot of prominent scientists, and I was sharing this. Uh, and uh, about two years ago, when we published a paper in Nature Methods to actually try to actually use some pillars for antibody validation that are being used in research. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but just say that we're trying to use these pillars now in the Protein Atlas to actually validate the data so we can trust what we see with the antibodies. And I'm not going to say very much about that. So uh, let's then move to the um, wellness profiling and longitudinal studies. Uh, with the resources we have now, we have a lot of antibodies, we have a lot of data. So what we would like to do, of course, is to use this in precision medicine uh, to actually try to go for the right treatment of the right pa patients, but also to develop better diagnostics. Um, and uh, what we formed a few years ago then 
was a new program to, and we started to try to define the wellness profiling of individuals using then state-of-the-art molecular analysis. And the idea here is to combine classical uh, clinical chemistry with very advanced medical imaging and then these new omics technologies and then try to define parameters for wellness and disease and so on. Um, we, we based this on a biobank study in, in Sweden called SCAPIS, which is uh, short for Swedish Cardiopulmonary Bioimaging Study. Uh, and this is a, a study that has now, it will almost be finished this year, I believe, uh, where you will take 30,000 men and women, take them in for one or two days, and then spend a lot of time to try to, to probe them with all these different medical imaging technologies, but also clinical chemistry, and also, of course, a lot of uh, questionnaires and so on and then only see them once and then follow them through the registers, which is very easy in, in Sweden, or fairly easy. Uh, a lot of the medical imaging is, is, is rather uh, interesting. So we use both CT scans and, and, and ultrasound and MRI uh, in order then to look at the obesity, look at the, uh, the fat, the emphysemia, and so on. So all of this is then probed once, and then we can then see what happens to these people. So what we decided then, since we only take in these people once, we also wanted to do a longitudinal study. So uh, base, what we decided then is to take 100 of these individuals and then follow them uh, in the beginning for two years, and t take them in every three months, and then do uh, a lot of analysis every three months, and throw at them all the omics technologies that you can think about. And then at the same time, get the questionnaire, so they have to then uh, answer, uh, answer what, what, what has happened with their health and so on, but also how they eat and so on. We also have activity meet meters, so we know when they are sleeping and when they are walking and so on. Um, in this case, we didn't want to have uh, people which has a known disease. So the inclusion criteria was that you should be between 50 and 65, uh, but also then randomly selected, so a, sort of a prospective. Um, it's very important when you do this to have a good nurse, and we were very lucky to have two fantastic nurses. Uh, uh, that sort of keeps these people motivated to have an activity tracker, you know, throughout the day and night, uh, but also to come in uh, every then three months. Uh, so out of the 101 that we recruited, 99 was, uh, did follow the first year, and after actually uh, two years, we only have, I think, five dropouts. Um, this just shows you the age distribution to the right here, uh, and then how this study was done to, to, uh, down here to the, on the bottom here. You can see every visit that a patient or individual did, and the different colors here represents the different visits, then visit one, two, three, four, and then five. And then we've also done visit six now. Um, the distribution is it's quite normal for these 100 people. You can see that the males in blue uh, weights a little bit more and have a, a, a larger waist, uh, while women has uh, more fat. Uh, and if you look at the BMI, it's kind of interesting to see uh, that women are even rather slim or, or, or a little bit more high BMI, while the men are more in, in average. Uh, not very many of the, we didn't do any coaching here, so, so, um, so um, the, most of the people stayed constant during these two years, uh, but there were some people, and I will come back to that, that either got infected or actually lost weight. So uh, that was kind of interesting to, to follow, although that was not the principal idea. So we're using this uh, national infrastructure for this, uh, the Science for Life lab, 
Uh, and here we have a lot of the new instruments for, for doing whole genome sequencing and CYTOF and metabolomics and so on. So basically all these 100 people were thrown at uh, w w all of these analyses, um, including microbiome and so on. Uh, this is a summary of all the things that we did then, and I'm not going to go through that in, in detail, just to say that we have whole genome sequencing on them, we have transcriptomics on the PBMCs, we have uh, done a lot of protein profiling, most notably Olink, who is the sponsor of, of this meeting I just heard. Um, and I will tell you quite a lot about the protein profiling. We also did immune cell profiling, metabolomics of course, lipidomics, uh, gut microbiota, and, and then also activity trackers and the standard clinical. So, uh, and also in the beginning when we have the medical imaging. So we have a lot of data collected during these uh, two years. To just give you a little feeling, here's just some, and I, I'm sure you can't really read here, but these um, plots then shows every individual and the level, for example, of vitamin D. And it's kind of nice to see up in, in, the, in this corner here that you can see that this is winter when the vitamin D goes down and this is summer when vitamin D goes up, which is of course not very surprising. You can also see uh, some uh, parameters like, of course, uh, uh, especially the uh, yeah, upper B here, you can see that the, the males have higher levels than the females. Uh, and also here you can see for CRP, you can see that some people got infections and the CRP goes up. So this is kind of nice then as a uh, background. Um, if you look at the correlation between all the variables, the clinical variables during the four visits, I'm not going to say very much about this, but it's kind of interesting to see, as expected, that ApoA1 correlates with HDL and is anti-correlated with ApoB and so on, just as we expect it to be. If you then take all the clinical chemistry parameters and put them into different PCA plots, then uh, so this is a PCA plot showing the 100 individuals. You can quite nicely see in blue here the males and the females are very nicely separated in this, which is not so surprising. If you then take the global profiles and do a kind of a PCA plot called TSNI, you can then uh, look at the 99 individuals uh, and each color here is then four different visits. And you can see for many of the, uh, the individuals, they stay in their, in their, their profile during the, the, in this case, one year. But you can also see here uh, these lines where individuals are moving in the TSD plot, uh, at least between one uh, of the visits. So it shows that they are actually, something has happened. Um, so what we did then, this was the clinical data, clinical chemistry, then we throwed all the different uh, platforms we have to do whole genome sequencing and microbiome and so on. And I'm just going to give you a teaser of this. Uh, we have now uh, actually close to one petabyte of processed data. Uh, and obviously one of the challenges now is to know exactly what to do now with all this data to get some knowledge out of it. But uh, I will show you some data here. One of the things that we did was to look at the autoimmune profiles and that is using our own uh, in-house systems to look at antibodies that are known to be uh, autoantibodies in humans. Uh, and these are again the 100 individuals and you can only see one spot here, but under here is actually four visits. So basically what it shows is that each individual has its own autoimmune profile uh, and it stays constant during one year, which is uh, quite nice to see. Uh, the same thing is true about the metabolome. We're actually looking at 1,490 different metabolites. And again, in most cases then, a single individual then during one year is sort of staying uh, at the profile of his, of his um, uh, but you can also see some that are actually moving in this, uh, this uh, PCA-like plot. For example, this one, one visit, second, third, fourth. So you can sort of see 
that things are changing for some of the individuals. The same is true about the immune cytome where we are looking at 117 cell types in the blood, uh, actually counted as much as 30 million cells. And this, I, I don't need to go into details here, but it's very interesting to see that also for this blood cell types, it's relatively constant during one year. Uh, but maybe the most interesting is to look at the proteins in plasma. So we're doing this in five different ways, actually four different ways. Uh, we, we're using the Luminex system, uh, but the, the ones that I will talk about, and which has been the most fruitful for us, is the Olink system, where we looked at 750 proteins. We also uh, started to use target proteomics, but I will not talk about that here. We have been talking to SOMASCAN, but actually now we have actually moved and are now using the Olink system. And then we also complemented this with the um, clinical protein assays at the commercial side. So if you then look at the Olink data, we're looking at 750 proteins in blood uh, during, in this case, the first year, which is four visits. Each one of these dots here is a person then. Red is a, a female and blue is a male. Uh, and what you can see, for example, for leptin, very, uh, very nicely you can see that the females have more of this protein than the males. And you can also see in most cases that it stays constant during a year. Here's another example, folate receptor 3. Um, here you can see that most of the individuals, I think about 90 of them, has rather low levels of folate receptor, but we also have eight individuals that have much higher levels, and these individuals, they stay constant during a, a whole year. So clearly here you have an example of, uh, of uh, a protein which you can divide up in two different groups. And uh, here you can also see that visit one to visit two, you can see that leptin stays constant. Visit one to visit two or folate receptor, again, it stays constant, but you have two very clear groups. So uh, one of the things that we have then looked at, what are the parameters, the protein levels that are, for example, related to the sort of BMI, weight, waste, and fat, and these kind of ridiculous circle plots then shows you uh, the proteins which are then related to BMI, weight and waste and so on. And again, what you can see is that the most significant one is leptin, PON3 is also related, and then you can see a whole bunch of proteins that actually relates to these parameters. And again, you can show here by this comparison between the uh, uh, leptin protein levels and the fat levels in, in, the, in the persons that you have a very nice correlation and you have an anti-correlation between weight and PON3 here. Um, this is an interesting example. This is a person that was heavily overweight, um, has, had a BMI of 120. And then during the third visit, the nurse actually, uh, I said there were no coaching, but she said that, you know, you have to start, stop eating uh, uh, so much. And he actually lost 17 kilos in three months. And it's very nice to see then all this, the cascade of protein things that are happening. Uh, of course, the leptin levels goes, goes uh, down very nicely. It is this... Uh, this violet plot here that shows proteins that actually goes down. There's a positive correlation between leptin and, 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 uh, and the weight and also the negative correlations. So you can then start to see these different types of proteins that turns up. We also had a few persons that got infected, not so surprisingly. Uh, one got a very serious um, infection in Thailand uh, and he came home and actually then, first of all, this is a, the, one of these plots where you show which are the proteins which are related to infection and CRP and, and other uh, in, uh, inflammation markers. Uh, and then you can also see in this plot for this individual that all of these proteins are elevated then uh, after he came home from, from Thailand. 
Uh, it's also, you can also see this in a PCA plot. Uh, this is not very easy to see, but this is now the guy that lost weight. Uh, you can then uh, see then that he actually, a lot of the parameters already started uh, at visit 3 and then he moved very much away from the visit 1 and 2. And this is the infectious guy that actually had an infection here and you can then see that he moves in the PCA plot. Um, so it's interesting then, we looked at 750 proteins with, with Olink um, and what you can see here is that most of these, this is the variation between individuals and this is a variation within an individual during one year. And you can see, for example, the folate receptor 3 is variation between individuals but not very much within an individual while you have other proteins here which are rather variant uh, in the individual but not between. And then you have uh, the exception is the growth hormone which is both variant between individuals uh, but also uh, between individuals. This is a complicated plot. It's one of these OPLS uh, mixed effect modeling where you actually compare then clinical parameters in black here with the protein levels in gray here and then you can actually see, for example, that leptin correlates with fat uh, and you can see other proteins which actually has relevance for the different clinical uh, parameters. Uh, but I'm not going to go into the details here. Um, so if you then look at the global profile, look at all the 750 proteins uh, in, in the plasma using the O-link, uh, and during one year then, what you can see here is what I think rather extraordinary. So everyone in, your, in this room has this unique profile of these uh, uh, blood proteins and they stay almost constant during one year. Uh, and obviously this is uh, something that we are very interesting to, to see. And I guess this, this is a summary of, this, of the ones that I've already shown. And what you can see here is that especially for protein profiles then and autoantibodies that you have this unique but also stable profile at least during one year. And now we have data for also or starting to get for a second year. So this is just to acknowledge a lot of people. It's a nice mixture of, of clinicians and, 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 and technologists. And, and uh, from, from actually from a lot of different universities that are doing this study. And I, only, I think I will skip the fourth and just say that we also just simply say that we're also very interested to try to define what are the actively secreted proteins in, in humans. Um, and what we are uh, finding is that there is about 1,000 almost 2,000 proteins that we think are actively secreted to the, to the blood uh, and therefore these are very interesting for us to study further and try to define what they are doing and so on and maybe have them as diagnostics in, in, in the future. What is also very interesting that almost one third or even more than one third of these proteins has an unknown function so obviously they are very interesting for also for human biology. So we started Human Secretome Project basically to produce all of these proteins in CHO cells and then use them as a resource to try to understand uh, what they are doing in blood. Uh, so uh, what we have done so far then is that we produced 1,400 of these proteins. We've done what we call phenotypic assays. Um, but uh, what we're trying to do now is to have a complete picture of all the actively secreted proteins in humans. So with that, uh, I just have one minute left. Uh, I just want to say a little bit about uh, what I, uh, the take home message here. Um, I think it's very exciting that we are in the era where all the building blocks of humans, both the DNA and proteins, are being systematically mapped by us and others. There's a lot of, of philanthropy money going into this. Um, I also want to say for me being a professor both at the Karolinska Institute which is a medical faculty and the Royal Institute which is a technical faculty, I think it's quite nice to have 
uh, or to see that a large part of life science here today is technology and data driven. Um, I talked a little bit about the Human Secretone project to try to annotate and, and uh, study all the proteins which are actively secreted to human blood. Uh, and then, of course, the precision medicine. I really think that this is a very nice start of, of trying to profile a baseline for individuals. And now we're moving, of course, into disease cohorts. Um, for us, it's been very, uh, in all the funding to these uh, projects have come from philanthropy, from foundations. So we're very happy with the Wallenberg Foundation funding the Protein Atlas. Uh, together with uh, the Novo Nordisk Foundation in Denmark, uh, Alan Parson Foundation uh, that are funding the precision medicine that I talked about, and the Heart and Lung Foundation. And then we also got some funding from the Sean Zuckerberg and actually also Elixir. So with that, uh, it's, um, it's been a fantastic project. We spend more than a thousand person years on this project. Um, and it's... Uh, uh, thanks to a lot of people that have been devoted to this, that we can actually put all of this data in the public domain. And this is where we are in Stockholm. Uh, this is the Karolinska Institute. Uh, this is the new hospital, one of the most expensive hospitals ever built. I don't know if that is good. Um, the Stockholm University, the Royal Institute of Technology, and then we have the Science for Life here, where we have this national infrastructure. So with that, I just want to thank you, and I still have 15 seconds left, so <laughs> thank you very much. I was wondering, what would be your favorite next step now that you kind of profiled out what 100 healthy human individuals look like in molecular terms? And would you now say, I'd rather now have an intervention with these 100 people? Mm. Or would you say, I'm now going to do the same on 100 diseased people? Or mm. how do you approach the next step, actually? Yeah. So obviously, so we have already, and actually we have already collected most of the data from three disease cohorts, a diabetes cohort with 100 people, which is nice because they have been identified through the scopies. They didn't know they had diabetes. And then they go on treatment with metformin. And then we actually start probing them before they, they do the metformin treatment, and then we follow them. So that's kind of a unique uh, sort of disease cohorts. Also, we have, uh, through the scopies then, we have identified people that has cardiovascular diseases, they don't know about it. And again, we are then following those for, with the same kind of technology. And then we're also moving into fat liver disease people, uh, obesity, uh, and following them. And in all cases, exactly what you said, we're following about 100. And obviously, 100 is not numbers that an epidemiologist would be proud of. So, uh, so obviously, uh, you know, uh, we see this still as pilots for, for you know, for in a way, technology pilots. Um, I would love to get, try to get funding for much larger. And I mean, our dream would in a way be to try to follow the 30,000 people that we have um, and go in. But in order to really get funding for that, I think that we need to convince the funders that there's something that we want to look for that is you know, interesting and, and, and not do it in this kind of fishing ex expedition that we're doing right now. So, so right now we're doing some of the um, the, um, the diseases, just to sort of see what, 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 what we found. And we, of course, we have a fantastic baseline to compare them with. Uh, we have decided not to go into coaching and, and, and these kind of things at this stage, uh, because it's, uh, it's still kind of a technology focus, I would say. Uh, but obviously that's also interesting. But as you know, th there's plenty of people that are doing that, the Leroy Hood at Seattle, and, Mike Snyder at Stanford and so on, they are very much focusing on doing these kind of interventions and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, 
what would you do? <laughs> well, what keeps me busy is that whatever you do, you always have to think about the age group that you're interested in. So yeah. if you take people of 50 and they're healthy, then in the next five years, not much is going to happen until you either do something to them, challenge mm. test or interventions or... So if you go to slight, slightly older people, then in five years' time, more will happen. Mm. And now, now back, uh, we have intervention studies in elderly people, so that mm. would also be 100 people before and after interventions. Mm -hmm. So while you were talking, I thought actually that, that if I would have all this money, I would make sure I get to those samples and do the mm. same to them. Yeah. Because you have a wonderful kind of start for profiling. Absolutely. So there, could, there might be other studies of the same number of people where there are controlled interventions or so, so mm. but at the same platforms that you're taking so that you can really build it up. Absolutely. That, no, and, and of course we're very fortunate because the Science for Life and national infrastructure, we only pay reagents, so we don't have to pay for infrastructure, we don't have to pay for instruments, we don't have to pay for personnel. So obviously actually these studies are relatively cheap. Uh, and only a fraction of what it would cost if you pay for all of these sort of things. And so uh, we are very, but I have to say though that, and we're kind of astonished to, our take home message in a way is that each one of in this room has his own unique omics profile. Uh, and probably when you want to compare a person to another person, you, uh, the baseline should actually be yourself one or two years earlier. And I don't, I don't think that's uh, very revolutionary to say that, but actually the data really suggest that. But also I have to say that uh, when you look at, as we've done with 750 proteins, there's not that many that are variable. So actually I think you can actually scale down this rather uh, nicely and pick the ones that are variable and relevant and so on. So, uh, uh, I, I kind of feel that this kind of fishing expeditions is more to say what are the relevant proteins to look at and maybe you don't need the whole genomes or whole transcriptomes and so on. That's, that's really interesting because the sort of the size and the depth you have to go and of course from a life course perspective I didn't you know when, when you started this did you have any ideas about how proteins I mean I'm not a yeah. basic scientist at all how pro how some proteins change over the life course? I mean, are all these people yeah. 100 are adults, aren't they? Yes, yeah, so, so in this case, uh, we, uh, because of scope is the inclusion criteria is 50 to 65, yes. and the idea that, uh, to have 50 to 65, of course, is that that's when you start to fall apart, and uh, you want people to kind of... Uh, uh, but we think things are going on much earlier as well. Yeah, like absolutely. You, you know, whether you could pick that up at a much earlier age. Yeah, and I, I think it's rather simple now to use the same kind of platforms then. So I, I should also say we have a collaboration with um, Solgrenska at, uh, in Göteborg where they have premature babies that are born in 23, 25 uh, week. So they are very, very sick. It's not very easy to get serum out of these babies, I have to tell. But uh, we are now doing we have some precious uh, sera that we are also following those. So you can actually do the very early ones, and now we've done the relatively old ones. I, 50, 65 is still young for me, but, uh, 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 <laughs> but uh, uh, we haven't done the sort of middle age where also a lot of things probably happen. Um, you, you, yeah. you addressed them. My main question is, you're clearly in the discovery stage, and then, yeah. uh, you know, if you want to go in larger population, you probably can scale down on what are the, uh, the transcript and the protein that are really significant. But you glance on your choice of the technology for proteins, and uh, we've been always struggling in measuring protein in serum and plasma. Yeah. And so I wonder whether you can expand for us on what, why you make that choice. You know, you haven't really pushed to the limit uh, the mass spectrometry because the dynamic range, but, but, but uh, I wonder whether you have a glimpse on what the future is going to be because clearly I think the measure in protein will be the, the, the change, change in the game because I think yeah. that the other, you know, omics are too active, but protein yeah. seem to be more stable. Yeah. 
No, it's a very good um, comment. And I guess from our point of view, we are taking the sort of samples that are you know, normally taking blood, urine, uh, uh, stool samples and so on. And, 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 uh, uh, and then well, the analysis we are doing is simply the ones that are available. So it's a little bit, you know, the lamppost and you look where the light is. Uh, uh, and, uh, and obviously we do this discovery in order to try to define, first of all, the baseline, but also hopefully then by moving into diseases, things that change in diseases. But what we are kind of, what I think is nice is to see that things are so stable in people because that means that you, know, you don't have a very noisy system in an individual. Uh, and if you then see things uh, when they get disease, we should probably be able to pick them up. And part of that is also that some of these methods are starting to become very quantitative. Uh, I think the new, uh, but you also mentioned mass spectrometry. We are actually putting a lot of efforts into uh, mass spectrometry. But the problem, of course, it's very hard to pick up things which are less than nanogram per ml. Uh, so therefore, you really need to push and push and push to go down. But we still have about a factor 1,000 in order to go down to where Olink is. So I think that still the Olink technology for us is, uh, I don't know if I'm doing too much, uh, pitching here, but, uh, but I, I, uh, mass spec is interesting, but it, you only can see the, you know, the more abundant proteins. Paul Matthews from Imperial College. I mean, a, a hugely impressive effort. Um, I, I wanted to come back to you know, this question of a uh, couple of questions. One is around stability, uh, which you mentioned. I mean, this is stability over a, a very limited period of time in you know, in a, in a remarkably homogeneous population, probably. Mm. And have you started to think about how to look at, um, uh, use that homogeneity in the population to look at snapshots over the age, over the life cycle, to try to get an understanding of, of change over time? And then the second, second question is, you know, the density of the data offers a remarkable opportunity for starting to model uh, across uh, omics data, mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, linking uh, uh, genomics to metabolomics via, you know, the transcriptome and the proteome. Have you started to explore that? Because that's something that you can do that very few other data sets are well positioned to explore. Yeah. So if I start with the second one, uh, obviously this is uh, exactly what we're doing. I didn't actually say anything about genomics and transcriptomics and uh, and so on. So we have, of course, that for all of these individuals. And we now, uh, at the Science for Life, we have 200 bioinformatics people, and they just love this, because you can throw this into them, and they, you can just say, start now to integrate and uh, see what you can find, and, and so on. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, uh, we have the data, but we don't really, uh, and we're trying to move to knowledge. But I, I agree completely with you now, is that this is a fantastic opportunity. And we also intend, in the end, to put all the data in the public domain, because we really think, of course, anonymized. Uh, but we all, and if the new rules can allow us to do that, uh, we don't know that when it comes to genomics. Uh, and that would then allow people in different places to then go through this and try to use their integration for uh, so So that's uh, the second question. What was the first question? Uh? About the taking snapshots through life to look yeah. at uh, the life course of these two. Molecules. Yeah, we, our starting point was the Scopis biobank effort, which is, you know, uh, individuals between 50 and 65, and uh, and basically this is uh, this is our niche in a way to use this very very, and I didn't even talk about that. We, we also have a lot of then imaging data for these patients, or I shouldn't say patients, individuals. Um, and as I also said, we're sort of going into very young uh, children. We're going into uh, uh, diseases, but it's a little bit anecdotal. 
uh, I have to say. Anecdotal. I mean, it's a little bit, you know, we're, we're kind of a little bit looking around, down a bit, you know, under the lamppost in a way. So uh, I, uh, it's not easy to, because you want to follow the same person for, uh, in order, and, and then we have to wait for a very long time to get that kind of, uh, but maybe it would be interesting to collaborate with people that have that kind of, of uh, biobanks. Yes, and also, um, I don't know whether there, we haven't got time to get into it, but you know, storage, whether where things would have been stored or yeah. can be used. I and, we, so, and I should say, in most of these cases, we've done a lot of technical stuff, and one of them was that when we had the, the, you know, the 100 first samples, for example, for plasma, we analyzed it. Then this, when we get the second batch, we also analyze the first one at the same time. And then now when we've done the sixth one, we actually analyze the first one and compare and, and so on. And we, we get very, very, very good reproducibility. So technically it seems to work very nicely.